So here to talk about what the next couple of weeks might look like, infectious diseases specialists Dr. Susie Hoda and Dr. Peter Uni, the scientific director of Ontario's COVID-19 science advisory table. Hello to the both of you. I guess, Dr. Hoda, if we can start right in with you, what do you think a lot of people still aren't processing about Omicron and, and what are they not getting about this moment we're all in? I think there are two things that people don't necessarily um, get yet. First, I'm not sure people understand just how quickly this can hit us. Um, you know, Omicron has a doubling time of two to three days. By the time it starts to take off, we can see a near vertical ascension in cases if we don't do anything to stop it. And so that's why it's important to recognize it now. The second thing is I keep hearing people talk about this causing milder illness. We don't have to worry about the case counts anymore. First of all, I don't think we know that for certain. Um, we're still learning about severity of illness. And second of all, even if it does cause less severe illness in Delta, if we're seeing a lot of cases, we're going to see more hospitalizations and bad outcomes and, and have you know to deal with that. Right. So, Dr. Uni, what are we saying here? I mean, how bad does this get? What, realistically, what is the worst case scenario here? Well, I can tell you for Ontario, right now we have roughly 600 cases per day of Omicron. And uh, since this doubles every two to three days, we could be way above 10,000 cases per day before New Year's Eve. That's the challenge we're talking about. And at that time, uh, our ICUs could start to struggle already here in Ontario. And it's that strain. That is, that is the most terrifying thought of all of this. Exactly. No, that's the challenge we have. Our healthcare system will be overwhelmed. Even if this is a little bit milder, uh, it can't be much biologically speaking. Uh, then we still struggle because cases are really uh, growing explosively. So uh, as we listen to all of you talk about this in sort of the big picture, I know that there are people at home saying, I hear you, but what am I supposed to do in the next few weeks? W you know, what happens to my plan? So can we game that out, Do Dr. Hoda? You know, a, a, a plan for meeting with uh, people who are double vaxxed or even triple vaxxed over Christmas. Would you feel comfortable doing that, being in that room? I mean, I think gatherings can happen, but it's maybe going to look a little bit differently from what you originally intended. First of all, get your booster dose if you're eligible to get it. Please do. Or if you haven't been vaccinated yet, please go ahead and get vaccinated with your first and second dose uh, and then third when it's time. But, you know, I think that with measures in place, you know, you might have to do smaller gatherings. You might not be able to do all gatherings that you initially wanted to. Um, keep them shorter. Think about doing some outdoors, being in well-ventilated spaces, rapid testing before you do some of the gatherings so that you know what people's status is and have the conversations in advance. So everyone knows about vaccination status. They can opt out if they want to. It's about people's risk tolerance as well. Um, so it's negotiations on that front. And by all means, if you are symptomatic or you think you might be coming down with symptoms, do not attend these gatherings. So I think if we put some of these rules into places, we could at least mitigate that risk um, and, and avoid getting into a situation where you, know, you have lots of contacts and you can have uh, a big outbreak. Very briefly, uh, Dr. Uni, to that point uh, about rapid tests, you know, what caution do you attach to them? I mean, can you make a mistake with them? For example. Oh, you absolutely can. You know, you can also make a mistake with a pregnancy test. Um, and yeah. so uh, first of all here, the problem is you need to sample properly in your nose. You know, you just uh, can't do this just as a tokenism. You really need enough material. And you can also just uh, make mistakes with the performance. We know that sensitivity decreases a bit if it's non-professionals doing them. So uh, you can't be completely sure, but it's a good way forward to use rapid tests in certain situations. And but keep gathering small. You can't exclude everything. And, and Dr. Uni, just to continue that point, I mean, in terms of the timing of when you should get the rapid test or when you should administer it, I mean, as soon as possible to the, the event that you're about to attend, certainly, but, but how far after exposure, I mean, would you need to wait in order for that test to be reliable? So first of all, what is important when you attend a meeting or something and you want the rapid test to be helpful, you do it immediately before the meeting because you want the status right now, what's happening right now with me. And if the viral load is high enough, then if you do the test well, then it will be positive and you know, oops, I have a problem. And if it's negative, if you did it well, then you ruled out that you're infectious right now. And what about between gatherings? Because I'm thinking if you rapid test and go to one event, and then the very next morning you rapid test, you go to the other event. Is that sound? Yeah, well, again, the challenge is what you want to do is just when you enter the, the, uh, the um, 
door and just go to the meeting to make sure that you're not infectious right now. And rapid tests, they seem to work still with Omicron. They must work, but we validate that right now, you know, as we speak. And um, they will basically show you the situation right now. Is the viral load high enough that your test gets positive? This would also mean the viral load is high enough that you actually can infect other people and you're interested in figuring out exactly that. Dr. Hoda, would we be in this situation if everyone who was eligible for a vaccine had gotten one? I mean, it's difficult for us to predict what it would look like if everyone got a vaccine. I, I think we have to think of this as a global situation. So that's the other important point is variants will continue to rise if we don't have everyone vaccinated across the world, if we're not doing everything possible to prevent across the world. So it is a global issue. And, um, you know, I don't think that we can think of this in isolation country by country. Of course, we want to protect our population as best as possible. Um, but it's, it's impossible to end this without thinking about it holistically. And uh, Dr. Uni, I just want to get your bottom line on all of this, because a couple of, at a couple of points now during this conversation, we've talked about the severity of Omicron, or at least what we know about the severity mm -hmm. of Omicron. And yet, uh, so many people that I speak to still believe that it is about as severe as the common cold. What would you say to those yeah. people? Well, it's simply not true. You know, you can uh, just uh, stay with your wishful thinking. It's simply not true. You know, the data we have right now, but the best data comes from Denmark, same risk of hospitalization as with previous variants. Uh, the data from South Africa may show that if you have uh, the situation of South Africa, young people, low average age of 27 years old, most of them already once infected, you know, more than 90% were infected. And uh, a lot of people have good immunity because they also received received vaccines, 35% or so. In this situation, it may be slightly less severe, but this can't be extrapolated to our situation. We're much older, we haven't had many infections, luckily enough, and we have a large pool of people who have never seen infection and never seen a vaccine needle. All right, Dr. Uni, Dr. Hoda, as always, thank you again for your insights. Thank you. Thanks a lot.